Hi kids, I'm your internet grandpa here and today we're going to continue reading from A Gathering of Days, a New England girls journal from 1830 to 1832. Um, we'll begin right away with chapter 11, Friday, May 6th, 1831. A Jew, a peddler, came by today the first Jew I have seen. His hair was long and his beard was scant, but it hung uncut. We did not ask him in the house, but offered food and cider to him, of which he took only the latter. I bought of him some needles and buttons, also sewing silk. He had scissors for sale at 12 cents each and some for twice that amount. When I inquired the difference between such amusement came to his eyes. His whole face was transformed. Well, now, I'll tell you, he said with a smile, and my compliments, miss. Then he explained that when first on the road, he sold his wares as cheap as he might, so to increase his trade. But customers told of his prices believed he carried tawdry stuff. To put the principal to the test, he made two packets of the self-same scissors, calling some fine and the others good buys, and found that people preferred the more costly, supposing them to be better. Since then, his goods were more dearly priced. Except, he concluded merrily, for someone with sharp eyes like yourself. And, leaving me to ponder this statement, he climbed up to his seat. Such a curious fellow and likable in his candor. I hope when he comes by again, he'll not neglect to call. Saturday, May 7th, 1831. I told Asa about the Jew. He was sorry he had not seen him. Monday, May 9th, 1831. Again, a letter for father from her, and father makes no secret of it. He is as eager as a boy and specially goes to the bridge on Mondays so as to be there when the mail's handed down from the Boston coach. Her letters are neatly sealed and folded and with a well-schooled hand. Besides them, my own look poor and untidy. Hard though I may try. Cassie, known to be delicate, is this week indisposed. Tuesday, May 10th, 1831. A new pine dresser was installed today, a large and handsome piece. Using salt and vinegar, we rubbed the pewter ware till it shone, and then set it out on the dresser. If we'll not use it till she comes, it will retain its luster, and such is my intent. Father goes in two weeks' time. He is very hard-pressed these days to put all in order. It came to me tis the very last time that this, our house, will be ours alone, and not also hers and Daniel's. Friday, May 13th, 1831. A cold rain with gray skies and chilly underfoot. Not much pleasure in bare feet today, especially as they are unaccustomed after the leather and housing of winter to go about unprotected. Maddie hops from stone to stone, rubs one foot against the other one's leg, looking like a cricket, and very streaked besides. I have to do it, she says, sensing my disapproval. That's the way I get them warm, and honest, I'll wash myself. Father, at least, is pleased with the rain, well-timed before the spring planting. Saturday, May 14th. 1831. Father has had a jacket made lest he appear too rude a sort in city company. Will not your old one do, I asked? The one you wore at closing day and still put on for church. Now, miss, he said, we'll have none of your sulks and none of your savings either. I tell you, we are fortunate that Mistress Higham has decided to make her home with us. So, the new jacket, sewn for a fee, by a seamstress woman in town. It is gray, as sheep's wool is, 
the color becomes him nicely. The stuff should wear well, I think, being closely woven. Tuesday, May 17th, 1831. Shall I have need of this or that? Please ask Catherine if. Yesterday's letter abounded with questions which Father read aloud. It seems not to think it odd that she should be so unknowing and so unashamed. Tis good, he approves, that she thinks to ask. How many others would? Come then, Catherine, what shall I say? Or do you prefer to prepare a reply that I may carry with me, it being of woman's work? Even Cassie, who is my friend, is wont to take her side. After all, Catherine, she enjoys, it must be ever so different for her living in Boston till now. Wednesday, May 18th, 1831. Father departed this morning. Again, he drove the shipman's team, both to hasten the journey and better present himself. The wagon itself was washed with care and have recovered the seats. The case in which Father packed his clothes bulged with a new-made woolen jacket, a fine linen shirt of Mr. Shipman's, and other items, his own and borrowed, that he will wear for the wedding itself or in the course of his stay. Also in the back of the wagon are some brooms to be traded. Might as well, and no reason not. They fetched an excellent price last month. He hopes they will do so again. Also, he took more maple sugar, and for the same reason. We do not generally trade two times, but Father's determined to make a fair impression on Mistress Higgins' family and will not appear before them without his pockets lined. He gave us each a kiss on parting. Look after your sister, were his words to me. Then quickly he mounted the wagon seat and adjusted the reins. I did my best to return his smile and wave till he was gone. Sunday, May 22nd, 1831. On this day in Boston they married. I will not call her mother. Thursday, May 26th, 1831. She is less tall than I expected, smaller even than Mrs. Shipman and plainer than Aunt Lucy. Daniel, too, is plain. He, however, is rather tall, with a sprinkling of freckles and none too large a jaw. Just below the crown of his head, his hair sticks out in a little tuft. D brushes it off in nervous gesture, but this avails him not. Yes, sir, no, sir, and thank you, sir, were all he said today. Tis quite a different brother we've got than I had expected, knowing the shipmen boys. Later, soon for the first time, when we got up to sleep, D will go up with us. He will use the further quarter towards the western side. Mr. Shipman and David this week helped carry up a new straw mattress and a rope bed frame. There is space alongside for a box of possessions such as D may have thought to bring. Father, now that he is returned, says he'll gladly drive some pegs for D to hang his clothes on, as many as he'll need. Maddie stares and stares. Meeting up with me, she whispered, Did you see, Kath? Did you see? He's got freckles inside his ears. <laughs> uh, Friday, May 27th, 1831. Though I know full well they gawked at the windows when Father's wagon came up the road, the shipmans waited until today before they made a call. We thought you might be tired a bit from the exhaustion of the journey, and here, you see, we brought you some pudding. Tis simple fare, but we're farmers here. But my sister, who is from Salem, enjoys it when she's here. Alas for Miss Shipman. I know she'd awaited with eagerness her new neighbor's arrival. Yet she, on this occasion of meeting, was awkward and out of grace. Perhaps she feared the Boston woman would scorn her country ways. But the Boston woman had worries of her own. So very kind of you, she smiled. The pudding will be delicious, I'm sure. Won't you please sit down? Here, let me drop a chair for you. Unless, of course, I didn't mean, well, perhaps it ought to stay by the window's light. 
Our father stood there quite dispossessed till arriving later than the others, Aunt Lucy saved the day. I hear you've come from Boston, she said, as if she'd talked of anything else for the past two weeks. Tell me, she said, is it true about... And all at once there were bursts of chatter, the ladies at least, at ease. Sabbath day, May 29th, 1831. All eyes turned when we entered the church. Father looked careful and very proud, again wore his new gray jacket. She seemed shy, as well she might, and kept her eyes cast down. Daniel walked between me and Maddie, looking straight ahead. People were curious, mostly kind, but when the, my ears caught someone's whisper, she's hardly got the first one's looks, I quickly hoped it escaped her hearing, although I think it true. The day being mild, we walked home slowly. Father talked gently all of the while, as if to ease the awkwardness at being so much on view. Chapter 12 Monday, May 30th, 1831 Around us all is fresh new green, new grass, small flowers, new leaf. On such a day, it is hard to recall the recent bogginess underfoot, the heavy mud on the roads. This morning, we carried down armloads of bedding, Maddie and I at her direction, to air in the fresh spring sun. Sun, not having been used of late, gave off a musty smell. Once, she paused looking out at the hills and spoke so softly as to make me think I was not meant to hear. Let, remember, let me remember this thankful moment later when I've doubts. Certainly, it was a curious thing for a new wife to say. Another time, as she folded a quilt, such fine work here and made for use, may I be proven worthy to carry on the task. Tuesday, May 31st, 1831. Talk started up about the Jew who had seen him and who had not and from whence he came. Uncle Jack, who chanced to be here, said it put him in mind of a story which he then put to father. A man there was who held that Italian was a favorite tongue. In argument with a Bible scholar, the latter preferred the Hebrew language. The former was heard to remark, you can't deny that when God Almighty thrust poor Adam out of Eden, he spoke Hebrew to, Hebrew to him. That may be, the scholar replied, but I take it as certainty that if God spoke Hebrew when Adam was ejected, Eve was speaking Italian when Adam was seduced. Father slapped his knee at this, as if to recall his pleasure, repeated the final line. Pleased by his story's great success, Uncle Jack chuckled, winked, and said, and they waste pupils good time these days on the study of Greek. Please, she said, compressing her lips, there are children here. She said no more, nor had to. Uncle Jack left soon thereafter, saying that he had much to do, and firmly refusing our father's entreaties to reconsider and stay. Afterwards, father fussed about, finally bursting forth to say, you know he meant no offense. Wednesday, June 1st, 1831. How different are the dresses she brought from those of Cassie's mother. Yet freely, she pegs an apron around them, puts a shawl atop them when chilled, and goes about as if unconcerned at her odd appearance. Open V's at throat and back, and well-shaped bodices tightly tucked, were never meant for farm work or the country life. Friday, June 3rd, 1831. Now we are busy from dawn to dusk with things she finds in need of doing, and all with our assistance. I think I have not seen Cassie to speak since she and Dee arrived. The last of the bedding has been brought down, including the quilts my own mother brought when she came as a bride. I worry lest she should inquire why there are only 11 of these instead of the usual dozen. How little we knew when we put it out 
what it was to befall. Within the house, we scrub and sweep. You would not think that before she came, I had cleaned it well. This, it seems, is spring cleaning and must be done from top to bottom, whether tis needed or no. Today, she enlisted Daniel's help to carry out, and in again, all the furnishings. Some of the pieces are assigned new places, the old plank table drawn near the hearth, the fashion, she says, in Boston. She intends to hang it with a cloth and set a lamp in the middle. The dresser's been moved to a far farther wall, handier to the work of the kitchen in her estimation. Still does the new chair retain its place and settles still at the fire. Last night, I sat there next to her while Father read from the Bible he so likes to do. Daniel and Maddie had been out of doors but came inside with darkness. Then, joining together, five voices as one, we easily followed Father in prayer and so retired to bed. Tuesday, June 7th, 1831. Cassie came by this morning to say I must come and see. They have a grand new mural along the stair and in the parlor too. The latter is in the most popular style but was done in a single day. It shows a hillside and farm and elms. The latter says Cassie in tiny leaf that it may be spring forever. The stenciler showed me a book he had from which I copied out nearly a page for my own future instruction. The stencils are made from metal plates, there being one for every color and of each part of the design. The desired effect of landscape or scene is achieved by the muralist through their knowing combination. In this manner, an entire scene may be ready constructed and far more quickly executed than by freehand drawing. From the Curious Arts by one Rufus Porter. Every object must be painted larger or smaller according to the distance at which it is represented. Thus, the proper height of trees in the second distance is one or two inches, the other objects in proportion, those in the first distance from six to ten inches generally, but those in the foreground, which are nearest, are frequently painted as large as the walls will admit. The colors also for distant objects, houses, ships, etc., must be varied, being mixed with more or less sky blue according to the distance of the object. By these means, the view will apparently recede from the eye and will have a very striking effect. Very striking effect indeed. I think I never till now have seen any murals as handsome as these. Tis hard to restrain my envy but I largely succeeded and confessed it not. Wednesday, June 8th, 1831. The start of summer school. Of our household and the shipmen's, I, Maddie, and Cassie will go. Asa and David will help their father. Willie might go, but that Mrs. Shipman is reluctant to give up her baby sooner than she must. Daniel, like the other boys, will be working the farm. Father notes this with quiet pride. I never thought before this time he might have minded that he must ever beg after help, thus wait until the others were done to commence his haying. We gladly helped him, Maddie and I, but our strength was insufficient for some shares of the work. At the schoolhouse, we were met with exclamations, happy tears, and crying after news. Mary Nelson, Joshua's sister, has gone we hear, to Tiltonboro for a summer's teaching position. Sophie's uncle, her mother's younger brother, got a foot so badly mangled, he had to cut it off. He is all right now. Maddie this morning was all impatience, and truly, one would not believe that any pupil before this day had studied penmanship. Father gave her a new lead plummet, which he had shaped himself. This implement dangles brightly from a new birch ruler brought for her by means of a flaxen string. Also from father, a sharpened quill from her pewter inkstand. I think this may have been her own when she was a girl. 
It bears the mark of frequent use, nor was it any of ours. She's promised, too, a new manuscript book, and though we have enough of plain paper at hand, Maddie's copybook is to be bound with pattern paper sent from Boston, but not yet arrived. The new teacher's name is Miss Orpha Williams. She is kind and tiny, hardly taller than I. I fear the larger of the boys, if such attend the school this summer, will take advantage of her. She was to have come a week ago, but was delayed in arrival. Thus is delayed also the opening of school. Thursday, June 9th, 1831. I heard the clatter as I came up the road coming home from school. The weaver, I thought, and so it was, earlier than in other years, but this is a different weaver than we've had before. She liked his looks, is all she said, and thought he was well-spoken. I would rather have waited for the one we knew. The loom set up in the parlor already, and from it, opened windows, the clatter emanates. He'll make a new coverlet for their bed, the dark blue pattern for the winter months and a lighter summer side. Tis a rather old-fashioned pattern, but still, she prefers it. And I think we'll call it a day today. We're over 20 minutes. I'll ask you, please like and subscribe, share it with your friends, and uh, check down in the description down below. You'll find a link to our Facebook page. Love for you to visit there and leave a comment or a request. Uh, YouTube won't, uh, won't allow comments on children's material, so that's why we have the Facebook channel. Thanks so much for visiting. Ta-ta for now, as our friend Tigger says. Love you guys. Bye-bye.